A treaty is an agreement under international law entered into by actors in international law, namely sovereign states and international organizations. A treaty may also be known as an agreement, protocol, covenant, convention, pact, or exchange of letters, among other terms. Regardless of terminology, all of these forms of agreements are, under international law, equally considered treaties and the rules are the same. Treaties can be loosely compared to contracts, both a means of willing parties assuming obligations among themselves, and a party to either that fails to live up to their obligations can be held liable under international law. Modern usage. A treaty is an official, express written agreement that states use to legally bind themselves. A treaty is the official document which expresses that agreement in words, and it is also the objective outcome of a ceremonial occasion which acknowledges the parties and their defined relationships. Modern form. Since the late 19th century, most treaties have followed a fairly consistent format. A treaty typically begins with a preamble describing the contracting parties and the joint objectives in executing the treaty, as well as summarizing any underlying events. Modern preambles are sometimes structured as a single very long sentence formatted into multiple paragraphs for readability, in which each of the paragraphs begins with a verb. The contracting parties' full names or sovereign titles are often included in the preamble, along with the full names and titles of their representatives, and a boilerplate clause about how their representatives have communicated their full powers and found them in good or proper form. The end of the preamble and the start of the actual agreement is often signaled by the words have agreed as follows. After the preamble comes, numbered articles which contain the substance of the party's actual agreement. Each article heading usually encompasses a paragraph. A long treaty may further group articles under chapter headings. Modern treaties, regardless of subject matter, usually contain articles governing where the final authentic copies of the treaty will be deposited and how any subsequent dispute is to their interpretation will be peacefully resolved. The end of a treaty, the eschatical, is often signaled by a clause like, in witness whereof, or, in faith whereof, the parties have affixed their signatures followed by the words done at then the site of the treaty's execution and the date of its execution. The date is typically written in its most formal, longest possible form. For example, the Charter of the United Nations was done at the city of San Francisco the 26th day of June, 1945. If the treaty is executed in multiple copies in different languages, that fact is always noted and is followed by a stipulation that the versions in different languages are equally authentic. The signatures of the party's representatives follow at the very end, when the text of a treaty is later reprinted, such as in a collection of treaties currently in effect. An editor will often append the dates on which the respective parties ratified the treaty and on which it came into effect for each party. Bilateral and Multilateral Treaties Bilateral treaties are concluded between two states or entities. It is possible, however, for a bilateral treaty to have more than two parties. Consider for instance the bilateral treaties between Switzerland and the European Union. Following the Swiss rejection of the European Economic Area Agreement, each of these treaties has 17 parties. These however are still bilateral, not multilateral, treaties. The parties are divided into two groups, the Swiss and the EU and its member states. The treaty establishes rights and obligations between the Swiss and the EU and the member states severally. It does not establish any rights and obligations amongst the EU and its member states. A multilateral treaty is concluded among several countries. The agreement establishes rights and obligations between each party and every other party. Multilateral treaties are often regional. Treaties of mutual guarantee are international compacts, e.g., the Treaty of Locarno which guarantees each signatory against attack from another, adding and amending treaty obligations. Reservations Reservations are essentially caveats to a state's acceptance of a treaty. 
Reservations are unilateral statements purporting to exclude or to modify the legal obligation and its effects on the reserving state. These must be included at the time of signing or ratification, i.e., a party cannot add a reservation after it has already joined a treaty. However, in the interest of encouraging the largest number of states to join treaties, a more permissive rule regarding reservations has emerged. While some treaties still expressly forbid any reservations, they are now generally permitted to the extent that they are not inconsistent with the goals and purposes of the treaty. When a state limits its treaty obligations through reservations, other states party to that treaty have the option to accept those reservations, object to them, or object and oppose them. If the state accepts them, both the reserving state and the accepting state are relieved of the reserved legal obligation as concerns their legal obligations to each other. If the state opposes, the parts of the treaty affected by the reservation drop out completely and no longer create any legal obligations on the reserving and accepting state, again only as concerns each other. Finally, if the state objects and opposes, there are no legal obligations under that treaty between those two state parties whatsoever. The objecting and opposing state essentially refuses to acknowledge the reserving state is a party to the treaty at all. Amendments There are three ways an existing treaty can be amended. First, formal amendment requires state parties to the treaty to go through the ratification process all over again. The renegotiation of treaty provisions can be long and protracted, and often some parties to the original treaty will not become parties to the amended treaty. When determining the legal obligations of states, one party to the original treaty and one a party to the amended treaty, the states will only be bound by the terms they both agreed upon. Treaties can also be amended informally by the Treaty Executive Council when the changes are only procedural. Technical change in customary international law can also amend a treaty, where state behavior evinces a new interpretation of the legal obligations under the treaty. Minor corrections to a treaty may be adopted by a process verbal, but a process verbal is generally reserved for changes to rectify obvious errors in the text adopted i.e., where the text adopted does not correctly reflect the intention of the parties adopting it. Protocols in international law and international relations A protocol is generally a treaty or international agreement that supplements a previous treaty or international agreement. A protocol can amend the previous treaty, or add additional provisions. Parties to the earlier agreement are not required to adopt the protocol. Sometimes this is made clearer by calling it an optional protocol, especially where many parties to the first agreement do not support the protocol. Some examples. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change established a framework for the development of binding greenhouse gas emission limits, while the Kyoto Protocol contained the specific provisions and regulations later agreed upon. Execution and implementation Treaties are may be seen as self-executing, in that merely becoming a party puts the treaty and all of its obligations in action. Other treaties are may be non-self-executing and require implementing legislation, a change in the domestic law of a state party that will direct or enable it to fulfill treaty obligations. An example of a treaty requiring such legislation would be one mandating local prosecution by a party for particular crimes. The division between the two is often not clear and is often politicized in disagreements within a government over a treaty. Since a non-self-executing treaty cannot be acted on without the proper change in domestic law, if a treaty requires implementing legislation, a state may be in default of its obligations by the failure of its legislature to pass the necessary domestic laws. Interpretation The language of treaties, like that of any law or contract, must be interpreted when the wording does not seem clear or it is not immediately apparent how it should be applied in a perhaps unforeseen circumstance. 
The Vienna Convention states that treaties are to be interpreted in good faith, according to the ordinary meaning given to the terms of the treaty, in their context and in the light of its object and purpose. International legal experts also often invoke the principle of maximum effectiveness which interprets treaty language as having the fullest force and effect possible to establish obligations between the parties. No one party to a treaty can impose its particular interpretation of the treaty upon the other parties. Consent may be implied, however, if the other parties fail to explicitly disavow that initially unilateral interpretation, particularly if that state has acted upon its view of the treaty without complaint. Consent by all parties to the treaty to a particular interpretation has the legal effect of adding another clause to the treaty. This is commonly called an authentic interpretation. International tribunals and arbiters are often called upon to resolve substantial disputes over treaty interpretations to establish the meaning in context. These judicial bodies may review the preparatory work from the negotiation and drafting of the treaty as well as the final, signed treaty itself. Consequences of terminology One significant part of treaty making is that signing a treaty implies recognition that the other side is a sovereign state and that the agreement being considered is enforceable under international law. Hence, nations can be very careful about terming an agreement to be a treaty. For example, within the United States, agreements between states are compacts and agreements between states and the federal government or between agencies of the government and memoranda of understanding. Another situation can occur when one party wishes to create an obligation under international law, but the other party does not. This factor has been at work with respect to discussions between North Korea and the United States over security guarantees and nuclear proliferation. The terminology can also be confusing because a treaty may and usually is named something other than a treaty, such as a convention, protocol, or simply agreement. Conversely some legal documents such as the Treaty of Waitangi are internationally considered to be documents under domestic law, ending treaty obligations. Withdrawal treaties are not necessarily permanently binding upon the signatory parties, as obligations in international law are traditionally viewed as arising only from the consent of states. Many treaties expressly allow a state to withdraw as long as it follows certain procedures of notification. For example, the single convention on narcotic drugs provides that the treaty will terminate if, as a result of denunciations, the number of parties falls below 40. Many treaties expressly forbid withdrawal. Article 56 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties provides that where a treaty is silent over whether or not it can be denounced there is a rebuttable presumption that it cannot be unilaterally denounced unless it can be shown that the parties intended to admit the possibility or the right of withdrawal can be implied into the terms of the treaty. The possibility of withdrawal depends on the terms of the treaty and its travaux preparatoire. It has, for example, been held that it is not possible to withdraw from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. When North Korea declared its intention to do this the Secretary-General of the United Nations, acting as registrar, said that original signatories of the ICCPR had not overlooked the possibility of explicitly providing for withdrawal, but rather had deliberately intended not to provide for it. Consequently, withdrawal was not possible. In practice, because of sovereignty, any state can withdraw from any treaty at any time. The question of whether this is permitted is really a question of how other states will react to the withdrawal. For instance, another state might impose sanctions or go to war over a treaty violation. If a state party's withdrawal is successful, its obligations under that treaty are considered terminated, and withdrawal by one party from a bilateral treaty of course terminates the treaty. When a state withdraws from a multilateral treaty, that treaty will still otherwise remain in force among the other parties, unless, of course, 
otherwise should or could be interpreted as agreed upon between the remaining states' parties to the treaty. Suspension and termination if a party has materially violated or breached its treaty obligations. The other parties may invoke this breach as grounds for temporarily suspending their obligations to that party under the treaty. A material breach may also be invoked as grounds for permanently terminating the treaty itself. A treaty breach does not automatically suspend or terminate treaty relations, however, it depends on how the other parties regard the breach and how they resolve to respond to it. Sometimes treaties will provide for the seriousness of a breach to be determined by a tribunal or other independent arbiter. An advantage of such an arbiter is that it prevents a party from prematurely and perhaps wrongfully suspending or terminating its own obligations due to another's alleged material breach. Treaties sometimes include provisions for self-termination, meaning that the treaty is automatically terminated if certain defined conditions are met. Some treaties are intended by the parties to be only temporarily binding and are set to expire on a given date. Other treaties are may self-terminate if the treaty is meant to exist only under certain conditions. A party may claim that a treaty should be terminated, even absent an express provision, if there has been a fundamental change in circumstances. Such a change is sufficient if unforeseen, if it undermined the essential basis of consent by a party, if it radically transforms the extent of obligations between the parties, and if the obligations are still to be performed. A party cannot base this claim on change brought about by its own breach of the treaty. This claim also cannot be used to invalidate treaties that establish or redo political boundaries. Historical cases where treaties were terminated in response the Islamic prophet Muhammad carried out a siege against the Banu Kanoka tribe known as the invasion of Banu Kanoka in February 624 Muhammad ordered his followers to attack the Banu Kanoka Jews for allegedly breaking the treaty known as the Constitution of Medina by pinning the clothes of a Muslim woman, which led to her being stripped naked as a result, a Muslim killed a Jew in retaliation, and the Jews in turn killed the Muslim man. This escalated to a chain of revenge killings, and enmity grew between Muslims and the Banu Kanoka, leading to the siege of their fortress. The tribe eventually surrendered to Muhammad, who initially wanted to kill the members of Banu Kanoka but ultimately yielded to Abdullah ibn Ubay's insistence and agreed to expel the Kanoka. Muhammad also ordered another siege on the Banu Kariza during the invasion of Banu Kariza because according to Muslim tradition he had been ordered to do so by the angel Gabriel. al yawakidi claims Muhammad had a treaty with the tribe which was torn apart. Stillman and Watt deny the authenticity of al waqidi al waqidi has been frequently criticized by Muslim writers, who claim that he is unreliable. 600 to 900 members of the Banu Kariza were beheaded after they surrendered. Another source says all males and one woman beheaded.